Hey everybody, my name is Mark and thanks so much for joining us for this week's Menlo Midweek Podcast where we're continuing the conversation from this past weekend with Phil Eubank, our lead pastor, around injustice and what to do when the world lets us down. This was a great conversation for the week that we're in, which we like to refer to as Holy Week, where we're journeying to the cross together this Friday for Good Friday, as well as celebrating together the empty tomb on Easter Sunday. And during this week, we'd love to invite you onto any one of our campuses for you to walk through our Stations of the Cross art installations. These are interactive stations for you to really set your mind upon some of the key moments and things that happened this week and in Jesus's life that led up to the cross on Good Friday, where we'd love to invite you to our Mountain View campus at 7 p.m. or online at 7 p.m. to join us for a contemplative service that really sets the stage for Easter Sunday, which of course is happening this Sunday at 8.30, 10, and 11.30 at each one of our campuses, including an egg hunt for all the kiddos after the 11.30 service. So love to see you somewhere this week, whether that's in person or online. And thank you, thank you, thank you for those that have said yes to helping volunteer this weekend and the yes to those that are shifting around your normal 10 o'clock service time to either join us at 8.30 or 11.30 in order to make space for some new friends that we have coming at the 10 a.m. service. So thank you all. Uh, I look forward to journeying together with you as we're heading to the cross this Sunday. And now let's go ahead and jump into today's conversation. Well, welcome everybody to the Menlo Midweek Podcast. My name is Mark. My name is Jessica. Phil's with us today. Woo! Hey, everybody. And we are caffeinated. Thanks to Phil. Thanks to Andy Town. Andy Town. And thanks to Andy Town. Not Phil's. Yes. Thanks to no, Phil. No. Thanks yeah. to Phil yeah. and yeah. Andy Town. Phil's is classy too. It's a good spot. It I like Phil's spot. also. Yeah. Um, Phil needed to be extra caffeinated today because uh, he has to wear all the hats right now. Uh, it is a, yeah, it's a unique week where I am, yeah, single dad mode. Alyssa is at the refuge, which is the soul care place that I go to. Mm-hmm. In the summertime, and you can go, there's like ladies trips in the wintertime, and so she's there with actually some other staff spouses yep. from Menlo, and so, yeah, doing normal life work plus mm-hmm. kid stuff. My uh, claim to fame is that so far, uh, I have cooked every night. Well, whoa, at least warmed up Costco meals, okay. like I haven't okay. gone out to eat, so we'll see. Tonight <laughs> might be the night that that changes, but... Yeah. You gotta have one fun night out, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Right. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. But we're making it. We're making yeah. it. Yeah. I'm trying my best not to just let my deep seated jealousy leach out in this conversation of people fly fishing in Montana. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is a safe space. Is we want to talk about it because it feels like injustice and betrayal <laughs> and all of the yeah. other things that we talked about so this good. last weekend. So good. I'm, Thinking about you, Rochelle, because mm-hmm. Mandy Thursday is coming up yeah, as well. Yeah, well, and Rochelle didn't fly fish, so you should talk to her about that. I, oh, I, I have. She sat in the boat. Yeah. yeah, she didn't fly fish. Oh. You know, that's all fishing, too. Mm-hmm. That's that's my take on fishing. And you don't have to catch fish. It's just all yeah. of it yeah. being yeah. out but there. But was she holding a... Nope. I don't think okay. so. Nope. Yeah. Well, then, so. how is that still fishing? Mark. You're just yeah. too Mark's kind. Mark's being kind. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll give Rochelle yeah. a hard yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. Could do it. You should do it. <laughs> <sighs> betrayal and injustice phil mm-hmm. another um lightweight topic yeah super we're going lightweight yeah. i mean yeah. after suffering the week i mean before, we're, we're, we're like, in let's... the we're in the yeah. passion week of jesus so <laughs> sure. i feel like <laughs> yes. if it wasn't getting increasingly more intense yeah, yeah, yeah. yes it would be a weird series yeah so. i was just Definitely. in the uh a walkthrough for our mm-hmm. easter service at the menlo park campus our 8 30 legacy service mm-hmm. and there was a video that they're potentially playing and it was literally like a minute talking about the cross, and I totally started crying. Yeah. <laughs> it was Aww. so powerful. Well, and it's like Anyways. I just think it's a cool, it's a cool season, right? Where mm-hmm. hopefully, especially if you've maybe doing been doing some Lent practices, whether that's devotional mm-hmm. or fasting from something or whatever, you know, it, it really is like it's preparing you to celebrate it together. And yeah. I was listening to Phil Wickham's Sunday's Coming, like mm. it's a track about Easter. Mm. And the same thing. I was like feeling emotional. It's mm-hmm. like two in the mm-hmm. afternoon on a Thursday. <laughs> like, what is happening right now? So, uh, yeah, you know, it's good. It's yeah. you're supposed to feel the feelings. Yeah, I think so. And we obviously want to dive in 
but we also want to talk about one, like one a way that we are trying to prep all of our community and deepening our understanding of this mm. weekend is encouraging us to come together onto campuses this week and walk through an art installation, yeah. which has just been really incredible. Mm-hmm. Like seeing it from the initial graphics to like the posters and now being able to experience the spaces too mm-hmm. on each of our campuses. Like if you haven't done that yet, you can do it at any time, come yeah. on to campus, walk through. And these, this is the Stations of the Cross and basically... Um, ways in which we can reflect on the last moments of Jesus' life leading up to this Sunday. Mm-hmm. So great job, Jess, for yeah. helping us get those to oh. all the campuses too, because I know that you had a hand in that. <laughs> yeah, and, shout out to our facilities team yeah. who had to build some stuff for some of these at the campuses. But yeah, if you, you know, maybe you attend a campus that's not as close to you, but um, all of the campuses have these up. So mm. if you like live closer to one campus, you can go to that campus too. Yeah. Um, and it's just a really beautiful way. We've been talking about this a little bit with here with Good Friday mm-hmm. and stuff. It's just a beautiful way to prepare mm-hmm. our hearts um, mm-hmm. for Easter Sunday. And mm-hmm. um, they're just, it's a really cool opportunity. You can go, uh, Mark Swarner said this last week, but you can go at like two in the morning if you can't sleep, get up and <laughs> go over there. They're up uh, 24 funny. 7. So. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Might have to have your flashlight out on your yeah, phone. Yeah. Sure. But it'll still be there. It'll still be there. <laughs> yep. But. Phil, let's jump in. Let's talk, talk a little great. bit about. Your message, we can dive in a little bit deeper once we get people up to speed if they missed it. Yeah, so we have been predominantly looking at individual scenes in the life of Jesus and uh, this kind of final Passion Week. I think this one is different because it's a little bit more truncated. We actually looked at three different scenes Mm -hmm. around this idea of like, what do we do when the world lets us down? And we know that there are times when we think about this in terms of just broader injustice in the world. And we go, there are parts of the world that uh, we're on the precipice of war or Mm. uh, people caught in the crossfire in Gaza that we're praying for and want to see an end to violence. Or uh, you think about people who are trapped in cyclical multi-generational poverty and that's injustice. Mm. And injustice is like deeply personal when Mm -hmm. somebody lets you down, when something Mm -hmm. falls through, when you Mm -hmm. pinned your hopes on something and it doesn't work out. And I think sometimes we can make justice one or the other of those things. But just like we talked about last week, so much of this stuff is in the tension that last week we talked about Uh, our suffering that we experience in life is a tragedy and tool for God. So justice is both uh, big and little. And I think these three scenes give us a snapshot to be able to see that from Judas betraying Jesus and bringing the guards to come take Jesus into custody in this like deeply personal, I mean, oh my goodness, when you know, Judas kisses Jesus as like the signal mm. uh, to the to the chief priests and the elders to 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 take him, and Jesus just like looks at Judas and says, "Friend, do what you have come to do." Mm. Like, just think about even just the word "friend," yeah, because that's what that was like—a kiss of peace that you would give your rabbi. And uh, wow. you think about like. We've all had people in our life that we thought were, were our boy, that we thought that was our girl, and mm-hmm. they betrayed us. They let us down. And, um, and so like, I think that feels like a really unique scene and moment, and we talk a little bit about that. And then kind of the systems that Jesus, as a Jewish man, mm. should have had to support him, um, systems that would have said, here is when um, a hearing like this should have taken place, here is who should have done that hearing. Here's the amount of time that it should have taken. Mm-hmm. Here's what a normal witness testimony should have looked like. And none of it mm. worked the way that it was supposed to yep. uh, because it was really just a show trial. Mm-hmm. And I think that there are lots of people in our world that feel like the systems have let them down. Mm. And, um, you know, it's not a, like a political statement. I'm not, I'm not trying to make political theorist comments, but I'm saying we can look around and go, uh, there is nobody on either side of the political divide in America that would say, like, the American system is working the way that it should today. Mm. Or if we look at a global scale with mm. nations at war or about to be, there's none of us who would go, oh, at a global level, the systems are working the way that they're supposed to work. They always remind us, even on their very best day, of just how broken the world around us is. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I think we feel that. And then, um, you know, the one that feels probably most personal to Jesus is when Peter 
um, denies him three times, right? And so this idea of someone that's closer than a friend, somebody that's a brother, you know, if you remember, Jesus is is telling the future of what would need to happen. And when when Peter finally figures it out, he's like, no, 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 you, you're, you're not going to do that. I'm not going to let you do that. And mm-hmm. after the Garden of Gethsemane, we kind of get a little bit of a sense of why Jesus responds to Peter the way that he does. But Jesus says back to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Because what Peter is offering to Jesus by a way where he doesn't have to die is actually temptation. Mm. And so uh, mm. all three of those things, right, whether it's friends that we have to choose to continue to have connection with, uh, even with boundaries, even choosing to find new friends when uh, disappointment takes place, or systems that undermine and sabotage us that we thought would keep us protected, or friends that were closer like family who have really let us down and cut deep, how do we respond at a personal level with the injustices in our life. Mm -hmm. And I think obviously with Jesus, we get such an incredible example of someone who walked through all of those things, never defended himself because he knew what the outcome needed to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that now that we have that, or we see an example of the the perfect way to do that, how do we do that? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think an important clarification is don't do it the way Jesus did. Okay. Because you're not trying to end up on a cross. So, um, you know, the the metaphor that Jesus gives us is a cross. He says, you should take up your cross, mm-hmm. deny yourself, and follow me daily. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that the principle of this uh, is what does it look like to be loving and gracious and hospitable? Mm-hmm. Uh, when Jesus says that you should love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, we get these principles that Jesus walks out so incredibly well. Um, but I also think, maybe we've talked about this before, but Jesus, um, in his uh, you know, Sermon on the Mount time, he does this thing that some commentators have called creative resistance, where um, when he says, uh, when someone hits you, have we talked about this before? Maybe. Uh, when when uh, someone hits you, you turn the other cheek. When someone asks you to carry something for them, they ask you to carry it a mile, carry it too. When someone asks for your okay. cloak, offer them your shirt also. Mm-hmm. Um, And to us, that just seems like a Jesus going above and beyond, saying go above and beyond, which it is that. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's also this idea that, especially at the time, you see it a little bit in the rest of the the Passion Week, where the Jewish people are living, they're subject to the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And there are choices that they have and choices that they don't have. Uh, walking a mile carrying something actually was a legal requirement. They didn't have a choice. So if a Roman soldier had walked up to them and saying, hey, I'm enlisting you, you're walking this with me for a mile, or they said, hey, I need your cloak, that wasn't an option. Um, But walking the second mile was. Uh, Giving the shirt was. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so it was this principle of the way that you can resist is actually to go above and beyond. Like, Hmm. give them a sense of what... um, Christian generosity looks like, Mm. even in the face of your persecution. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, there is probably some of that that we can do. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, what does it look like uh, to still have boundaries, to still have um, safe people in your life, Mm -hmm. but when uh, you have a unhelpful, unhealthy boss, like, what does creative resistance look like for you as a team member? When you're in a marriage Mm -hmm. that feels suffocating and hard and somebody's maybe like always looking for uh something to nitpick what does creative resistance look in that what does it look like to model Mm -hmm. the kind of love that jesus modeled for us i think that's probably the better question Mm -hmm. recognizing that when the world fails us because it will always let us down Mm -hmm. that jesus is the only one that And so what does it look like to lean into friends, even when friends have let us down? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to trust systems? Because we have to trust systems. There's no way to live in life without it, Mm -hmm. even when we know they will sabotage us sometimes. What does it look like to have brothers and sisters, even when we know brothers and sisters will betray us from time to time? Mm -hmm. It means to look at the example of Jesus and trust that if he could do it, Mm -hmm. we can do it in him. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. I always come back to... How, like, how was Jesus able to do this? And I think you've laid it out pretty well that said, like, he knew what his mission was, and he lived that. He tried arguing the other way. He right. said, I'll exhaust all options, but yes, this is what must happen. So where's the intersection between, like, our personal missions and then being able, because like you said, the world will let us down. Yeah. So how can we also kind of hold to that same idea of where we need to go personally? Right. And where does that intersect with trusting systems, knowing that people will let us down? Because there is a human component to that as well. 
as the yes, you exist here within all of this other stuff that's happening. Yeah, I mean, I think there is uh, hopefully a trust that we can have that God's sovereign, right? Like mm-hmm. one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture, we will look at um, a little bit Good Friday, but it's mm. you know when Jesus is with Pilate and Pilate goes, "Hey, dude, speak up for yourself," and Jesus is like, he still doesn't advocate for himself, just like. Mm-hmm. In this passage, Jesus doesn't advocate for himself, but Pilate, who's like rooting for him, Pilate's like, I am freaked out by you. Please give me a reason to not <laughs> have you yeah. flogged, scourged, killed. Mm-hmm. Um, and he says, don't you know that I have the authority to kill you? Like, do you not realize what the stakes are here? Mm-hmm. And Jesus goes, oh, no, 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 no. Like, you, you have no authority, but the th- authority that the Heavenly Father's given you, mm-hmm. I'm going to lay my life down, I'm going to pick it back up, which mm-hmm. is like the most OG statement of Jesus ever. <laughs> <laughs> and I think mm-hmm. understanding, like, that God with that authority is our God today. Mm-hmm. And so even in the midst of whatever you're facing, mm-hmm. yeah, there's an already not yet component to our faith, mm-hmm. but God is working in broken systems, in people that fail, in brothers and sisters that betray. Mm-hmm. God is doing that, like, right now. And so if there's an injustice that you're experiencing, it doesn't mean that you should never put up boundaries. It doesn't mean that you should not advocate for yourself. You absolutely should. And in the midst of what you're facing, mm-hmm. you don't have to be the only one advocating for you because you ha- we have an advocate, right? Yeah. Like mm-hmm. yep. the, the thing that's so crazy about this passage is that when we get to the systems breaking down, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. The, the person that is putting Jesus on false trial and finding Jesus guilty is the high priest. Mm -hmm. And like when you go to Hebrews, Jesus is the high priest. Mm -hmm. So you have a temporary imperfect high priest who's trying to figure out how to get this thing done so that the high holy days aren't messed up, which by the way is another violation of doing capital punishment like this. They shouldn't have been doing it at this time. and he is finding the actual high priest guilty of a crime he didn't commit. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a wild reality. <laughs> yeah. And so I think it's it's a little bit more about I think the the um, sort of what is our mental perspective as we experience hardship in our life? Are we only walking with God until it hurts, mm-hmm. uh, or can we trust God in the midst of it hurting? And we see Jesus trusting the plan of the Father even when it hurts. Yeah, that's so good. And there's, there's conversations that I've had, especially with people that may be newer to Christianity that says, I thought I signed up for like, once I, once I say yes to this, like my life's going to be good, <laughs> but it's not. Nope. And so there's a, there's a personal theology component as well in understanding what it means to follow Jesus. And so I, I love that you have said like, suff- like, this is all part of it. And we're not, if Jesus couldn't escape it, like we can't really either. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and here's the thing. We want, like we say, and I talked about it a little bit this weekend, mm-hmm. uh, we say we want the world to not have sin and brokenness. We don't say it that way. We say, I don't want suffering. Mm. I want justice everywhere. Mm-hmm. But we actually don't want that. <laughs> like, we don't okay. really. Because if we did, there'd be this like pretty big mirror that would get raised. The more justice that we would be asking for. What we really want is... If it's like zero to 100, 100 is perfectly just, there's no brokenness in the world, no sin, no suffering, and zero is complete and total anarchy, and we rate ourselves at like a 65, what we really want is like 64. That's what we actually want, Mm. right? Mm. Um, Because if it was 65, then we're accountable, right? If it's 100, we don't exist. And so the the like crazy thing is we're not a 64, we're like a 6.4. Hmm. right? The Bible says all of our best deeds apart from Jesus are actually like filthy rags. We are desperately wicked. That's what our heart is. Who can know it? Mm-hmm. Uh, the pride of man is a snare. Like we we are not, mm-hmm. we're not getting a passing grade. And so when we go, I just want the world to be just. Like, I think that's true. I actually think we all do want the world to be just. But what justice means in the world is I want it to go well with everybody. What justice means in the Bible is reality corresponds to God's character. And I promise you, mm. if that's the vision of justice that was implemented today, uh, it would be very, very different, very, very different, very different than what we see on a regular basis. I saw some confessional uh, thing from an ancient Puritan earlier today, and it was like Jesus came 2,000 years ago to slay the sin in mankind, and the next time he comes, he will come to uh, slay the mankind of sin. 
<laughs> wow. And you're just like, yeah, I don't like how that feels, <laughs> right? Like, Dang. that's why that that's why the church fathers call this the yeah. grace age, right? Yeah. And so we don't like suffering, but suffering comes with grace. Mm-hmm. The more patience and grace that God extends to sinners like us, the more suffering we will experience. Mm. Mm. My mind got stuck on just Jesus slaying, and that was just... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was going to... Slay, 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 Leading to a meme for a slay. second. I was like, okay, I like where this is going. And then that took a hard left. Mm. From, okay, okay. Yep. Wow. That's a lot, Phil. I mean, it's Passion Week, bro. It is. <laughs> it is. Uh, I want to ask you something specifically around Passion Week. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think because it maybe more people are searching around this, I'm getting a lot more shorts or YouTube recommendations or whatever, kind of apologetics-wise about... Jesus on the cross. And two two questions that I've heard very non-nuanced and probably poor answers to, and I'd love to hear your answers, cool. um, would be Jesus is on the cross. He's crying out to his dad. He's saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? People have argued that that means, one, that Jesus is not God because he cannot cry out to someone outside of himself. Again, I'm just laying out the argument mm-hmm. as I'm here. Yep, yep. <laughs> as well as... Um, Maybe that, let me just stick for there for now. And, mm-hmm. well, yeah, can, well, I think, yep. um, you, you know, the the concept of the biblical trinity is maybe the most difficult concept that we have in the entire Bible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, that the nature of God is that we have a monotheistic religious structure in which we believe in one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Mm -hmm. They exist in perfect unity and in perfect relationship for all of eternity in a self-giving Trinitarian um, uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. So we see Jesus talk to the Father all the time. So it would be a problem Mm -hmm. way earlier than the cross. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think Jesus is talking to the Father... We know, like, we can go to First Thessalonians, where Paul says that we should actually be praying without ceasing. We should be talking to the Father all the time. Mm-hmm. We know that Jesus was talking to the Father all the time, but then he also had these special moments where he was pulling away and spending dedicated time with his Father. Um, we don't get to know uh, exactly what the Trinity looks like in eternity, but when we go to Genesis 1 and 2, and we stumble over passages like, let us make man in our own image, it it feels as though there is a conversation within the Trinity that's taking place before creation even takes place. So, like, not even Jesus as a human, just like Jesus as God Mm -hmm. in heaven before the foundations of the world, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's one. In addition, Jesus on earth in... Uh, his humanity, he gives up his sword. I, I joke around like he gives up the S on his chest and the cape around his neck. And so when somebody says to him, hey, when are you coming back? And he says, only the Father knows. He's not lying. Mm-hmm. And so we know that that's a theological concept called kenosis, mm-hmm. where Jesus is literally saying like, I'm not going to tap into my divine nature. Now, this is the stuff that will blow your mind. This is like deep theology work. Jesus is still Jesus. His divinity is still functioning. Book of Colossians says that um, all things were made by him, through him, for him. All things are sustained by Jesus himself. Hmm. So Jesus is the voice in Genesis 1 that's creating everything because the Father is a spirit, not a person. Uh, I mean, theologically a person, but not like he's not walking around. Um, And then you have uh, Jesus, while he's walking on planet Earth, he is sustaining the molecular molecular structure of the earth he's walking on. Well, he's not tapping into his divinity and living perfect humanity. Mm. So if somebody's like, that seems confusing, I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> oh, totally get it. Yeah, for sure. Um, but I think that idea of even though he existed as God, did not count equality with God as something to be grabbed by himself, nothing, take on the form of flesh, becoming obedient even to the point of death, Philippians 1 um, that's what we see on the cross. So Jesus is saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is feeling mm-hmm. God's judgment for all of us in that moment. And theologians have written volumes about the theological implications of that sentence. Right. So I don't want to minimize, mm-hmm. uh, but I think the idea that it means that 
uh, Jesus isn't God, because how could he talk to God? I would say we have examples of the Trinity talking to one another before creation, in the midst of creation, earlier than that in his life, and even after Jesus ascended to the Father. So mm-hmm. uh, I, I don't know that that argument holds a lot of weight to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's what I figured you would say. <laughs> yeah. <I'd ask> it. <laughs> how would you translate the word forsaken, like, into... For somebody who doesn't maybe know biblical scripture, when you hear that word forsaken, what is that actually, what is he actually saying? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, Jesus had never felt rejected by his father ever. And I think Mm -hmm. he was saying, I feel rejected, Mm. right? Um, You know, the line that the father had to look at Jesus and see us so that he could look at us and see Jesus. That's... That's the, that's called the great exchange is the mm-hmm. like theological mm-hmm. paradigm. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think Jesus is describing an emotional feeling in his flesh that he had never felt. Mm. Mm. It's and a human, then, the human and, feeling. And, yeah. yeah. And then when we go to Hebrews and it says, we have a great high priest. Again, think about the high priest that mm-hmm. is literally sentencing him, mm-hmm. trying to get him to Pilate so he can get him killed because they had to get approval from Rome in order to kill someone. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, it was this weird way for those religious leaders. This is not all Jews, by the way. We have to be really careful. This is not an anti-Semitic text. This is one group of uh, corrupt leaders that I actually think God was using divinely to bring this plan about. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but in the midst of that, like, we have a great high priest who is sympathetic. He understands our pain. He has lived the same kind of life that we've lived and mm-hmm. suffered like we suffer. Mm-hmm. And in this moment, you could argue... He suffered way more, right? Crucifixion after scourging is the pinnacle Mm -hmm. of human depravity in coming up with the way to exact as much physical pain from someone as they could get before they died. That happens physically. And then spiritually, the eternal connection he felt to the Father, it sure feels like something was different for a second. Um, I'm not going to speculate what that was or wasn't, but Jesus in his own words says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm-hmm. And I just think, like, Jesus can probably relate to the pain and suffering you're going through way more than you mm-hmm. sometimes give him credit for. Yeah. And I'm so glad that we are kind of pressing into these not-so-feel-good conversations because it really brings the full Easter to fruition. Sure. Like, you cannot have Sunday without Friday. Absolutely. And so I... I used to be in the, I just want to feel good on Easter Sunday. Mm-hmm. I get that Jesus died, but I want to gloss over that. And so sure. if you are like me or were like me, um, I would, again, encourage encourage you to spend some time this week reading through these passages of Scripture, actually trying to um, set yourself in the stage to be in the crowd, watching and observing what you are reading. And it will hopefully try, it like, like it did with me, expand one, your relationship with God, but also like you kind of think about it differently after that too. Like yeah. it's just, there's a different depth there. So, well, and I think the reminder, right? Like Jesus didn't do this. He didn't do this cause he had to, Mm-mm. right? Like the motivation for which mm-hmm. God, mm-hmm. Th- this is the like sort of teleological argument. Mm-hmm. The, the foundation for which God did this is the same reason that he sent Jesus is the same reason that he created planet earth. Like, the reason that all of this got created in the first place is because of God's overwhelming love for his creation, for us, that we were created in his image. When he hit start, he knew that the cross was coming. Mm. This was never a surprise. It was before the foundations of the world that God chose you. It was before the foundations of the world that all these things were put in place in which Jesus would have to come, fully God, fully man, die in our place. All of that was set stage way before anything ever started, Mm. outside the corridors of time. And when you look at it through that lens, you go, wow. And, you know, so much of us, we want to turn off parts of our life, turn off these areas of dysfunction and addiction and things that we know are not honoring to God. Um, But I think we can't do that without understanding where our affections are being redirected towards, right? There's a reason that the first command is about idolatry. 
uh, that ultimately, if we understand what God's done for us and why he's done it, hopefully that, that creates in us greater love. We love God because he first loved us. The deeper we grow in our appreciation of God's love for us, hopefully the deeper our love for him is reciprocated. And as a result, those things inside of us that are getting in the way of that are much easier to displace because we have all this love from God and for God that can fill that place. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to just behave your manager your way out of it, it's just what's the next routine? What's the next New Year's resolution? What's the next behavior modification thing? Mm -hmm. It is exhausting. Yep. And those routines can so easily be disrupted by betrayal or disappointment or disruption. And so there if if you look at it on the other other side of that, like those things can also be a catalyst for growth. For sure. If you have yeah. correct perspective and understanding about. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The preacher way to say that, right, is that the Maybe pain in this life will make us bitter or it'll make us better. Hmm. Right. And it just depends hmm. on who we take it to. Hmm. If we take it to our flesh and we take it to a world that will justify bitterness, yeah, make us way more bitter. Mm -hmm. But if we go, God, this is awful and broken and I can't believe that people would do this and mm -hmm. I feel so frustrated and God's going, I get it. Mm -hmm. Like I've been there, you know, mm -hmm. and I love you anyway. And if you can believe it, I love them too. <laughs> like mm -hmm. that, those are the two directions that we go. And, yep. you know, one of the amazing things to watch is the compound interest nature of the decisions we make in this space over the decades. So, you know, people within moments, when mm -hmm. you're talking to somebody in their seventies and eighties and nineties, you can tell which path have they been on? Not for days, but for decades. That were like, oh, this person is really crabby about everything. Like, I'm guessing <laughs> that those decisions of bitterness started decades ago. Yeah. And when you're with people, Barb and Norm are my example from Colorado, really sweet couple. We have some couples mm -hmm. here at Menlo that are like this for me mm -hmm. as well, where you interact with them and they're in their 80s or 90s and they are just like the most kind, mm -hmm. thoughtful people. They didn't start that way yesterday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, they've been, yep. they've been stacking bricks for decades. And yep. so I think the choice is, which which bricks are we going to stack? Mm. It's great. Yeah, because there's also a lot of crotchety old people who yes. have been stacking yes. those bitter bricks. <laughs> That's for exactly a long time. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> That's funny. I would say true, I yeah. would say it's more likely, right, that by the end of our lives, like entitlement mm -hmm. in our culture has led us to be more and more frustrated, crabby, and entitled. Mm -hmm. um, but part of the creative resistance is like, what does it mean? Like, what does it mean for me at eighty? to be more optimistic, more hopeful, more loving, and more generous than I am at 40. Yeah. I hope that's the case. Yeah. Like, I hope that's the path that I'm headed yeah. on. And I know that apart from Jesus, I'll never get there. Yeah. Yep. That's not going to happen me by me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. I just hear your voice ringing in my head. If you have a pulse, God has a plan for you. <laughs> no matter I've right heard now that. Yeah, yeah. or <laughs> if you're 80. Like, God yep, still yep. has a plan that's for right. you. And I yeah. see that in some of my volunteers, too. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you her age, but Carol H., if you're yeah, yeah. an online viewer yeah, or been around Carol. the office a bit, she is one of those people for me yeah. um, where it's just like the way that she is now did not start a year ago mm -hmm. or 10 years ago. Yeah. Like it is just a lifetime of obedience yeah. and, and worship has got her to there. And it's yeah. truly inspiring. Yeah. Nancy yeah. Florence on our staff. Oh my too. gosh, oh. Nancy Florence! Yeah, 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 we're yeah, doing yeah, yeah. Uh, incredible. Yeah, we're doing these cohorts as a team, and she's on mine. And I just was just so blessed hearing her story. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's just such also a powerful reminder of like God doesn't stop using you. God yeah, doesn't yeah. stop changing you. God mm -hmm. doesn't stop moving in you cuz yeah, she's yeah. like still growing and learning all these really cool things about mm -hmm. who God is and, you know, mm -hmm. and and yet she just still is she bakes us cookies and That's brings incredible. them to our group. Yeah, well there's <laughs> so uh I, I so Jerry Soderberg who is at Mountain, Mountain View. View. Mm -hmm. Hi Jerry. Um I had lunch with Jerry just a couple of weeks ago and I mean, same story, like just she's incredible, incredible, yeah. so kind, so thoughtful. Shout out to Frank and Sally. Mm -hmm. Frank's been going through some huge health stuff. Lots of mm -hmm. people praying for him. Mm -hmm. Our elders had a chance to get around Frank just a couple of weeks ago and pray for him and mm -hmm. Sally and hear a story. And you're just like, bro, like, I mean, his mm -hmm. perspective is just. God's using it. I'm going to keep pressing mm -hmm. in. I'm thankful that I'm still here and that God can use my story. And I'm like, you yeah. are yeah. in Even Jenny, right? Like yeah. the story that we highlighted yeah. in a weekend, like how often does a story like that happen where someone experiences tragic loss mm -hmm. and God's belt loop is nowhere to be found, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Those are just individual daily choices that we make and they are just taking us down a path. Mm -hmm. We are choosing the path that we're going to go down. Awesome. Yeah. Um, 
Well, Phil, thank you. And thank you for truly setting the stage for us um, to experience Easter together. Yeah. And before then, to experience Good Friday. Yeah. So uh, what are your hopes for a Good Friday service? Hope and Good Friday is an interesting... <laughs> I know. That's an interesting... I know. I thought, I'm glad you caught that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think... <laughs> we hope that you'll uh, come and that you'll cry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, so last year we did two different Good Friday experiences, one at uh, Mountain View and one at Menlo Park. For several reasons, we're doing it all at Mountain View this time, mm-hmm. which I think will be great. Yeah. Uh, it's a, a little bit really more cool. central location. Um, it'll let Me- uh, Menlo Park get kind of like a little bit more prepped for a few more folks that come to this campus. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it'll be a great chance if you've never been to the Mountain View location for you to be there. Um, but I think that what you described, Mark, is what most of us do, which is mm-hmm. this is hard, this is tough to look at, so I'm not going to look at mm-hmm. it. And uh, mm-hmm. Good Friday is like, oh, look at it, you know? And uh, mm. it's Good Friday is good because Easter is coming. Mm-hmm. Like that's the... That's the, uh, if you're like, what's the point of Good Friday? That's what it is. Why is it called good when yeah, it's yeah, actually yeah, yeah. horrible? It's good because of what it accomplishes. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I just think like looking into the face of Jesus in your mind, hanging on the cross for you is something that mm. we should be regularly reminded, not just of the victory of our salvation, but of the cost of our salvation. And Good Friday reminds us of the cost. Mm-hmm. That as we think about like sin is not an abstraction, It's an actual thing that Jesus came to deal with. Now, I grew up in a church context where where you were going to go someday was way more important than what was happening today. Mm -hmm. And I think the kingdom of heaven, it is about heaven someday, but it is also about the kingdom of heaven today. It's both. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think we want to forget that heaven and hell are at stake. That's what we're talking about. But it's not just about the hell you might be going to. It's about the hell that you're going through. And so I think that trying to... um, avoid that conversation, whether that's for you or maybe you have somebody in your life who's not a Christian who's never been to something like Good Friday, it, it really could be honestly like a paradigm-shifting experience for them. You'll have to have conversations beforehand about why it's going to feel different than a normal church service and mm-hmm. after, but you should be having those conversations mm-hmm. anyway if you bring somebody to church with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think if you want, you know, I think it's a Batman quote, uh, the the um, uh, the darkness is just is is darkest just before the dawn or whatever mm-hmm. you know like mm-hmm. Easter feels way more powerful when you let yourself remember mm-hmm. and look at face to face the cost of your salvation yeah and go early to Mountain View and do the Stations of the Cross yeah, yeah. before you yep. start the good we start the Good Friday service yeah. Or you could Tarantino it and do the Good Friday service and then walk around after. Tarantino it? Yeah. Like how you would play the end of the movies at the beginning. Oh. <laughs> You're welcome. A cinematic experience yeah. referred to as in media res. Mm. Thank you, Phil. Mm-hmm. I got you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jess, if people want to start laying some spiritual bricks, mm. we have some opportunities of that some coming up. Brick layers. Um, can you talk about some of the cool things that we have available, if, even for people that haven't ever volunteered with us before, some mm-hmm. opportunities for Easter that people might be able to hang yes, out Yes, there's mm-hmm. tons of those. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, go to menlo.church slash Easter and scroll down to, there's a serve at Easter section and you can click on uh, the campus that you're interested in. Everything from helping in the kids' classrooms to passing out bulletins to greeting people, coffee, donuts. Um, There's lots and lots of opportunities. Um, Each campus has unique opportunities as well. So definitely check that out. Um, You know, it's just also a great reminder of if you think about yourself stepping onto a campus for the first time and no one says hi to you for a Mm -hmm. long time, that's not going to feel good. Mm -hmm. And so you can be one of those people that literally just has to smile and wave and maybe hold a sign that says, welcome to Easter. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just such an easy opportunity to serve and make people feel happy to be there and welcomed and seen and known. And um, yeah, so there's plenty of ways you can do that. Awesome. And then let's give a a one minute um, preview on the series to come as well. I know that we've previewed this a bit. <laughs> yes, we have. Yes, we have. Um, we'll, so if you want a fuller yeah. preview, you can go back a couple episodes ago. We yeah. gave this about a good 10 minutes or so at the mm-hmm. end of one last podcast. But yeah, yeah. So we are going to do a series uh, in partnership with several other Bay Area churches uh, called Wonderfully Made, immediately mm-hmm. following Easter, where we'll discover new ideas from ancient truths about your body, gender, and sexuality. And if you're like, Wait, I need to slow the podcast down and listen to that again. Yeah, we're actually <laughs> going to talk about this because mm-hmm. clarity is kindness. 
And uncertainty leads to anxiety. And we are in an age of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we are not going to be culture warriors on that. We're not going to be uh, trying to beat people over the head with two or three Bible passages, making you feel terrible. We're not going to be cultural capitulators and just surrender all orthodoxy in the space of gender, sexuality, mm -hmm. and marriage in your body. Uh, we're going to say, hey, we're all sexually broken. The foot of the cross is even for all of us. We all need Jesus in this conversation. There is both conviction and compassion that we want to bring to it. Mm -hmm. And so we will have a five-week series that will sort of break that down, hopefully in thoughtful, intellectually honest, and kind ways. Uh, and then we're going to have some community events mm -hmm. uh, throughout it. You can find out more about those and sign up for them at menlo.church slash wonderfully made. Pay attention to the location because because we're sh sharing resources and doing some of these things together. Some of them are happening Mm -hmm. at a Menlo Park location, or Menlo Church location here at Menlo Park. Some of them are happening at Echo Church, which is a multi-site church down near San Jose. Some of them are happening at Westgate mm -hmm. uh, down in Saratoga. So the, the locations are all listed there, and you can sign up for them. Uh, but everything from students going, hey, how do I think about TikTok theology that I'm hearing is one thing, but is actually something way different. How do I combat that? Or uh, a guy named Preston Sprinkle, who's really kind of a national leader in this conversation, to be able to talk about, hey, how do we, uh, as the church, can, can we be a place of belonging, even before someone believes, even before they uh, maybe are experiencing the transformation that God has for them? How can we do that better mm -hmm. as a church without surrendering all convictions? Because Menlo does hold to a uh, theologically traditional view of gender and sexuality. Um, and so I hope that between the events and the weekends, it will be a life-giving series for our church. Um, and it's not, you know, this doesn't represent a, a change in our theology. We're just telling people what we believe. We're also a place that believes in generous orthodoxy. So we want to live in the tension of, we know not everyone will agree with this, and that's okay. And we, we're glad you're here anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to be a place that uh, is about the long path of repentance and surrender and hospitality. And so uh, hopefully people will sense that in this series as well. I have family members who are LGBTQ. My best friend in high school came out to me. Uh, I have people very close to me in my life. Mm -hmm. Literally, I'm having conversations with members of the LGBTQ community at Menlo mm -hmm. um, on a daily basis right mm -hmm. now, trying to make sure that as much as I can, I'm informing this series with the real life implications of what it means for our church. And so, um, yeah, I hope that it's, mm -hmm. uh, it serves our church well for yeah. the season ahead. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I think y you all as listeners can help us do this as well um, in the way that we are trying to continue conversations with coworkers and friends. We also want you to help um, continue the conversation throughout the week. So we're going to have the text number that you hear all the time, 650-600-0402, available for you to send in your questions. And the podcast might look a little bit different during that series. It could for be sure. Phil and some of these other communicators at other churches. It could be us doing Q&A with Phil or other leaders around that can help us tackle some of your questions. But uh, we're trying to approach this as one long series of conversation, not broken up into a Sunday and a Sunday and a Sunday totally. and a Sunday. We want this to be um, the water that we're swimming in so that we can truly understand how God views us and how we should view others. And so that's not a one hour on a Sunday conversation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. There's also, if you go to that same website, menlo.church slash wonderfully made, we already have a lot of resources on there, different books you can uh, read, different mm -hmm. podcasts you can listen to. Um, our adult discipleship team wrote out a study guide, a series resource so for cool. life groups, so good. how to listen well, how so to have good. these conversations. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not a life group leader, you might even want to just read that. Um, and it's, yeah, there's just some really helpful tools on this page that Phil and some of our other team also spoke into to make sure that, hey, if you just want to do some more research in there, we also already have all of these sermon titles and descriptions. overviews, mm -hmm. descriptions yeah, yeah. for cool. all five weeks. So if you're like, what in the world are they going to talk about? Yeah. It's already on there, so you can get a head start. Yeah. there's. I mean, there's a lot of men and women in this conversation. I am so glad for where the church is today versus where it was a decade ago, mm. uh, because thoughtful, nuanced, kind, and clear resources mm -hmm. actually are available. Yeah. And for so long, this just felt like a caricature, right? You had mm -hmm. just these really loud uh, extremes, and the, mm -hmm. the middle was so sort of strategically ambiguous. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully, as a church, we can lead with clarity and kindness at the same time. Yeah. Yep. So, 
Well, we are praying for you all this week. Um, we're encouraging you to dive into all the feelings. Um, we're encouraging you to um, really sit and wrestle with how good Good Friday is and why it is good and how that sheds light on Easter. So, yeah, absolutely. And a quick shout out to <laughs> Cheryl Fletcher leaving our team. We talked about it this last weekend. Um, Cheryl's incredible. Yes. We're tremendously thankful. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think she's done a lot of really good things for Menlo. And one of the things that she has done so well for Menlo is honestly just leaving with the highest level of character and class. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. amazing for her to be able to take a step and enter a season of rest and recovery after the last four years and to do it in a way that's so honoring to our church. Yeah. Um, hopefully we'll be able to have Cheryl back uh, to be able to be a part of our speaking team in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, but just shout out to Cheryl. So thankful for her. And if you weren't a part of that uh, this last weekend, you can go listen to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had Cheryl with me at the top and just had a chance to pray for her. And there's a way for you. Yep. Um, there's a way for you. We can probably put in the show notes. Sure. If you want to drop in a note of appreciation for Cheryl, we've set yep. something up to be able to do that as well. Sounds great. We love you, Cheryl. Yes. <laughs> love you. Miss uh, you already. <laughs> yeah. All right. Have a great week, everybody. Text us if you need anything. See you soon. Bye.